I don't, to be topical a second, I'm not sure how Margie would, if she was with us today, react to the idea of the state of Illinois issuing licenses to people to carry concealed weapons. But I am very sure of how Margie would feel about the idea of the state of Illinois issuing licenses to people to get married and not have to conceal it. I told Reverend Sonia over at Good Shepherd, right after we lost Margie, that we needed to recruit 10 people to take her place. And maybe I should have amended that to say 10 ordinary people, because Margie was an extraordinary person. She was a great lady, and I am proud to say that I was a friend of Margie Parker. Thank you. Gary, thank you so much. It's lovely a remembrance of Mrs. Parker. We're glad that her husband is here tonight with us and many friends and you all who've had long relationships with her. Well, I have the joy and the honor of introducing our speaker for this evening. Uh, it was conceived back in the fall that we would want to, as a Peace Coalition for the Teach-In, have a theme of, of talking about drones and what really is going on with that with the policy uh, of our government uh, to talk about the danger there for the world. And um, we have been blessed uh, by having someone right here in our own state. Uh, uh, he lives in Urbana by the name of Robert Neyman, who is the policy director at Just Foreign Policy. Just Foreign Policy Group is an independent and nonpartisan membership organization that's dedicated to reforming U.S. foreign policy to serve the interests and reflect the values of the broad majority of Americans rather than those of special interests, both inside and outside of government. Mr. Naaman himself is a prolific writer uh, on reforming U.S. foreign policy. He edits the Just Foreign Policy News Summary and writes on U.S. foreign policy at Huffington Post. He's president of the board of Truthout. Um, Bob has worked as a policy analyst and researcher at the Center for Economic and Policy Research and Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. I have just met him this afternoon, and uh, we had dinner with a small group of us, and I can tell you firsthand what a delightful, informative, committed person he is around these issues particularly tonight as we hear around uh, drones and issues. He has a master's degree in economics and, and mathematics from the University of Illinois and studied and worked in the Middle East. And his, his topic tonight will be for us a drone policy. And we are so glad to have him with us. Will you welcome him, please? Thank you for that warm introduction. I'm delighted to be here with you in Carbondale tonight. I've been giving talks on the drone strike policy around the United States in such places as Albuquerque, New Mexico, Santa Fe, Flagstaff, Durham, North Carolina, Milwaukee, Minneapolis. Uh, and uh, I had to fly to most of these places. I drove to Terre Haute. Um, I drove to Chicago, but uh, it was it was a delight to just hop on the train in Champaign this morning uh, and Carbondale. And I'm particularly delighted also to be in Carbondale uh, because you and I have something in common. In well, obviously there's many things in common, but one particular thing in common that I want to point out is that we all have Dick Durbin as a U.S. senator and. Uh, in this particular case of the drone strike policy, uh, as on some other issues, um, Dick Durbin is going to be key to our efforts to reform the policy, as I'll try and explain and motivate in my uh, talk tonight. But I want to start with a little exercise that I've been doing around the country in uh, giving talks um, about the drone strikes. I want to ask you two questions about the uh, the state of your opinions today about the policy and, and 
a question of the form, if the election were held today. And uh, in order to try and get your honest opinion, as one would in an opinion poll or an election, I'm going to ask you not to narc on your fellow audience members when I ask you these questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to cover your eyes, shut, shut and cover your eyes, so there won't be any peer pressure in the room. Because obviously, you know, you know who I am, you know, who, who else is in the room. But I want to get your honest opinion. I've, I've been succeeding in doing this other places. So the first question is, is your opinion right now that there are significant moral, ethical, political, legal problems with the drone strike policy. I'm looking for, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm going to tell you what the choices are. Choices are yes, that's one choice. The second choice is no. And the third choice is don't know, not sure, need for more information. It's very important to always have that third choice there, right? Not push people into uh, yes or no. They're not ready to be pushed there. Okay, so those are going to be the three choices. Eyes closed, no narking, no spine. Is it your opinion right now? Raise your hand. There are significant ethical, legal, political problems with the drone strike policy. Okay, put your hands down. Is it your opinion that there are not significant ethical, legal, political program problems with the drone strike policy? Okay, good. Put your hands down. Uh, raise your hand if you're not sure. Need more information. Make a judgment. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Second question. Assuming that there are, assuming we take the discussion that there are significant ethical, legal, political problems with the drone strike program, is it your opinion that people in this room and people like us could do something meaningful, significant to change this policy, to reform this policy, in the next one to four years? as a result of ordinary political action. By ordinary, I mean not involving tremendous personal sacrifice, a huge change in your priorities in life. Just ordinary political engagement as you define it, whatever you would do on other issues that you're concerned about. Is it your opinion today that people in this room, people like us, could do something significant about this policy to reform it? Again, looking for one of three answers. Yes, no, not sure, need more information. Raise your hand if you think that people in this room and people like us could do something about this policy. Okay, put your hands down. Raise your hand if you don't think that people in this room, people like us, could do something about this policy. Okay, put your hands down. Raise your hands if you're not sure, need more information. Okay, good. You can open your eyes now, and I'm going to tell you what happened in this room. Hang on, hang on. I'm going to tell you what happened in this room. It doesn't matter. You know, this is not a quiz, it's not an exam, no right. I'm just getting a sense of the room. It's a struggle. So, what happened in this room, and what's happened in 90% of the rooms in which I've asked this question, is that overwhelmingly, when I ask, do you think there are significant problems with this policy? You said yes. Almost everyone said yes. This room, no one said. A few people said they weren't sure. Need more information. When I asked you if you thought that people in this room, people like us, could do something about this policy, the room split three ways. Yes, no, not sure. And to me, that's quite devastating. And this is the over this happened in the overwhelming majority of rooms which I ask this question. I mean, usually, not always, usually it's the case everybody in the room already thinks there's a significant problem. Selection <coughs> bias, right? We gave you the talk. But then, in the group of people who already think there's a very serious problem, only a third think we can do something about it. A third don't think we can do anything about it. And a third aren't sure. So, Given that that's the case, I submit that my task here, my principal task and responsibility, is not to convince you, most of you, that there is a problem with the policy, which you already believe. 
but to convince you that we could do something about it, which the majority of you do not already believe. Okay? So that's going to be, since I knew that was going to happen, <laughs> that's going to be the focus uh, of my talk. But I'm going to do the two things together. Obviously, the two things are totally related, right? Uh, because the how you understand the problem informs what you're going to do about it, informs what you're going to say to other people, uh, individually, in groups, what letters you're going to write, letters to the editor you're going to write, or op-eds, <coughs> how you're going to reach out to members of Congress. Right? So I want to start, now here's your cue, to give me a screen. <coughs> Excellent. So, I want to show you a video. How many people in this room have seen this video before, Living Under Drones? Good. So, the rest of you are going to be introduced to something new. This video is seven minutes long. It was made by Robert Greenwell, some of you may know, a relatively well-known documentary a filmmaker. He made a Walmart the high cost of low price. Uh, went to Pakistan and uh, interviewed people there. But he, he also, uh, a focus of this video is he interviewed two law school professors, uh, James Cavallaro of uh, Stanford Law and Sarah Knuki of uh, New York University uh, Law School, who uh, also went to Pakistan and wrote a report about the drone strike policy. And based on interviews, with Pakistanis, in particular, Pakistanis from the tribal area who were survivors uh, of the drone strike policy. And the reason, there are a couple of reasons why I think this video is so significant. It was clear to me when the Rand Paul filibuster happened of the uh, John Brennan nomination to be head of the CIA, there was kind of a split that happened. Everybody that I know that was already engaged on the issue of drone strikes was totally delighted, ecstatic, euphoric over the Rand Paul filibuster. Best thing that ever happened to us and our issue in the United States in terms of putting it on the table uh, of public conversation. But there was another group of people who were not really following the issue, who were kind of like rubbed their eyes and they're like, what's going on here? Who is this crazy Rand Paul person attacking the president? And, you know, there was a poll, actually, that Huffington Post did, that found that the majority of liberal Democrats, uh, given a choice between this was uh, an important thing that raised important issues versus this is a political stunt that wasn't necessary. No, it's a political stunt that wasn't necessary. So I went back, when, when that happened, I went back to this video, and I thought to myself, you know, if these people had just seen this seven-minute video, they wouldn't say this was a cheap political stunt that had no meaning, right? They didn't have context. So, I maintain, you remember eight-minute apps? So this is like seven minutes on the drone strike. Like, you can't get people to do anything else. And I think the first hurdle we have to cross in public opinion is just getting, you know, like, the first step to recovery, acknowledge that you have a problem, so the first thing that we need to do in terms of U.S. public opinion is we need to acknowledge that we have a problem. And I submit that a fair-minded person can watch the video that you're about to see and that I hope you'll share with them without acknowledging at least that we have a problem. So I hope you agree with me that the video that we just watched is a powerful tool, given that we all know people who don't think there's a problem, don't think that there's a significant problem. And I hope that if I can't get you to do anything else, and I know there's some people that I can't get to do anything else, 
always are. That's okay. Because now there's one thing that you could very easily do. You could share this video, you know, Twitter and Facebook, email it to people that you know and don't think there's a problem and say, okay, look, watch this seven minute video and then tell me that there's no problem. So, I didn't just come here to tell you there was a problem. I came here to tell you that there's something that we can do about it. And in particular, I claim that the most or a key thing to, to shed a light on in this moment, uh, trying to do something about this policy, is the question of secrecy. The fact that this policy, this strong strike policy, is officially secret. It's an official secret. It's not a secret in fact. Obviously not. We know that it exists. It is reported in the press to some degree. But the official policy of the United States government is that CIA drone strikes in Pakistan are secret. And therefore, they don't have to answer questions about the policy on the record. And as long as this is the case, we cannot have democracy on this issue. There's a black hole in our democracy, and this policy is inside the black hole. The ACLU and the New York Times went to court against the U.S. government in 2010, suing under the Freedom of Information Act for memos written by the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel purporting to give legal justification to this policy. The response of the United States government was, we do not even have to answer the question of whether there are CIA drone strikes in Pakistan because that's secret. So how can we have effective democratic oversight of this policy. We can't. There are key questions of fact about this policy that have not been established in public discourse. Unlike other issues like Social Security. It's a big debate going on over Social Security. But when people talk about the future of the Social Security program, there are issues of fact that are shared across the debate. Conservative liberals rely on numbers from the U.S. government about projected finances of Social Security. It's a shared framework. That's not the case with this policy. So, for example, the record of independent reporting as reflected in this video. There's hundreds of civilian deaths in Pakistan. On the rare occasions when U.S. officials have spoken about the policy of the record, they've claimed that civilian deaths have been exceedingly rare, extremely rare. So a simple fact like how many civilians, how many innocent civilians has the United States killed in Pakistan? CIA drone strikes in 2004. There is no public answer to this question. I'm not talking about the specific number, I'm talking about the scale. Like is it hundreds? Or is it tens? We don't know. I mean, we don't officially know. We think we know. I think I know. The Bureau of Investigative Journalism in London has done a tally, which is reflected in this video. And most critics of the policy think that this tally, this tally is basically correct, even conservative. But the US government won't acknowledge it. There is an official story about this policy that has two key components. One of them is the claim that civilian deaths have been extremely rare. And the other is the claim that this policy is narrowly focused on top-level terrorist targets. But again, this is disputed. That's the official story. 
The record of independent reporting suggests that the overwhelming majority of people who've been killed have not been top-level terrorists. In fact, just this week, uh, Jonathan Lande of uh, McClatchy, National Security Reporter McClatchy, McClatchy had a, an article saying, based on a review of classified records, it's not true that this policy is focused on, narrowly focused on, top-level terrorist leaders. Okay, well, this is crucial. I mean, the answer to these questions is crucial. Is it true or not that civilian, have civilian deaths been frequent or rare? Is it true or not this is targeted, narrowly targeted on terrorist leaders? For one thing, we know from some recent public opinion polling that it matters to the public the answer to these two questions. If you ask people, how do you feel about, if you ask Americans, how do you feel about drone strike on top-level terrorist sub, uh, suspects, if they're precise and there's no danger of civilian casualties, majority supports that. If you ask people, uh, what about going after anyone who is suspected of being a terrorist, the majority doesn't support that. And if you ask people, what if there is a risk of civilian casualty? Then the majority doesn't support that. So it's crucial to know what is the case. And public opinion polling that seems to indicate, and you see this reported in the Washington Post and Gallup, seems to indicate public support for the program, is suspect. Because the official story has these two whoppers in it. Very few civilian deaths, narrowly focused on terrorist leaders. So, it seems reasonable to suppose that when people tell pollsters that they support drone strikes, they support, depending on the question is asked, support drone strikes and terrorist leaders, Essentially what they're saying is that they support a fantasy. They support a fairy tale that's been peddled in the media. They don't support the actual policy that exists on planet Earth about which they don't know. So therefore, they couldn't support it because they don't know what it is. The polling, polling suggests that if they didn't know what it was, they wouldn't support it. So, you see, this question of secrecy and transparency is absolutely crucial. It's not just a good government issue, it's a life and death issue of forcing into public debate key questions about what is the reality on the ground? What, you know, we know the fairy story, what's the reality of what has actually taken place in Pakistan? Now, there's two crucial questions that I want to bring your attention to. There is this collection of memos that actually specify what the policy is. And until now, not only have the American people not seen these memos, but the Congressional Oversight Committees have not seen these memos. When President Obama nominated John Brennan to head the CIA. Eleven senators, led by Ron White, including Dick Durbin, sent a letter to the administration saying, before we consider Brennan's nomination, we want to see these memos that we've been asking for for more than a year that spell out what the policy is. And it was in that context where the Senate Intelligence Committee essentially refused to confirm Brennan until the administration shared information, that the administration finally started to cough up some information. So, you know, the lesson here, not surprisingly, is pressure works, absence of pressure doesn't work. Members of the House and Senate have been running the administration for years asking for this information and been ignored. It wasn't until there was pressure that the administration started to move. Okay, how did they move? How they moved was they shared some, not all, 
of these memos with the Senate Intelligence Committee and haven't shared any of these memos, as far as we know, with the Judiciary Committees. The Judiciary Committees are supposed to oversee the Justice Department that produced the memos. And in an extreme illustration of the Alice in Wonderland world of this policy, Attorney General Eric Holder was recently in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, he was a regular oversight hearing, and this was after the white paper, so-called white paper, was leaked, this unclassified document that summarized some of the drone strike memos. And it had a lot of controversy around it because people saw that the official policy of the Obama administration outlined in this white paper is to reinvent the word imminent in the context of the justification of drone strikes and say that although in you know international law the uh, you know, in order to claim self-defense, that an attack is in self-defense, the either somebody's attacking you or they're about to attack you. What the administration said in this memo was, well, you know, it's a new world, we have this global war on terror, and we can't wait while danger gathers, I'm familiar, and uh, if, somebody, if we believe that somebody's a member of Al-Qaeda or an associated force, we don't have to wait till we have specific evidence that that person, um, has attacked the United States, is planning to attack the United States. It's sufficient to, that we think we know that they belong to one of these organizations. We can assume that they will, they would, in the future attack us when they get the chance, and we have to hit them now. That was the argument put out in the white paper that caused tremendous controversy. Senator Lee, Mike Lee, Republican, Senate Judiciary Committee said, to hold on, I'm very concerned about what's in this white paper, what you're doing with the word imminent, how it relates to law, i.e. not. And Attorney General Holder said, well, you know, you can't just read the white paper in isolation. You, you have to read the white paper in conjunction with the underlying Office on Legal Counsel memos it was big, on which it's based. In other words, what Attorney General Holder was saying, you can't understand the policy without access to the legal memos that the administration is refusing to allow you to see, okay? That's the Alice in Wonderland world of the policy. And in this context, how much confidence do you have in claims that Congress is doing oversight of this policy when they don't even have the documents that say what the policy is? After the confirmation hearing of Brennan, Dianne Feinstein, the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, was speaking to reporters. And it was reported that Senator Feinstein, who chaired the Senate Intelligence Committee, which is supposed to oversee the Central Intelligence Agency, which is conducting drone strikes, Senator Feinstein said she was unaware of reports that the U.S., that the CIA, was counting every military-aged male killed by a U.S. drone strike as a militant. This is a fact that had been reported six months earlier in a major expose of the New York Times based on interviews with senior administration officials. And Dianne Feinstein, who's chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, who claims that the Senate Intelligence Committee is doing careful oversight of the CIA and drone strikes says she was unaware of what was reported in the New York Times six months earlier. How much confidence do you have that Congress is doing effective oversight of this program? Until now, there's never been a significant public congressional hearing on the drone strike policy. Just in the last few months, the issue has come into other hearings, like the Holder hearing, like the, the Brennan confirmation hearing. There's never been a hearing focused on the drone strike policy. Next week, that's going to change. Because Senator Durbin, who's chair of the Constitution Subcommittee 
of the Senate Judiciary Committee is holding a hearing on the drone strike policy on April 16th at 10 a.m. Eastern, 9 o'clock Central. This is going to be the first time there's ever been a hearing of this nature. And so this is a key moment of opportunity to try to get information into public debate about what is actually happening with this policy. What happened before with the filibuster, with the Rand Paul filibuster and the, and the controversy around Brennan's nomination, at least allowed the idea that there's controversy into public debate. But these, these key facts, these key reports about the policy are not yet widely known. As they could become much more widely known as a result of this hearing next week. Okay, so what are my asks of you? First of all, I want you to help me publicize this hearing and make it a big deal. A huge part of the world we live in is what's important and what's not important. You know, what is the media focus on and what is the media barrier on page 17? So help me make this hearing a big deal by telling people about it, by watching it if you can, following press coverage about it, sharing press coverage about it. Second, please contact Senator Durbin prior to this hearing by email, by phone, by postcard. I understand there's going to be some postcards. And ask him in this hearing to publicly say that he supports the issuing of a congressional subpoena for the drone strike memos if the administration won't hand them over. Senator Lee, the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, has said, has threatened public hearing in the Holder hearing, he threatened a subpoena to the drone strike memos. It's, a, you know, it's how Congress compels a recalcitrant administration to hand over information. But it hasn't happened so far. So this is a key threat. Remember, pressure works, not pressure doesn't work. This is a key element of congressional pressure. So the first thing I want you to ask everybody to do, say publicly, let the word subpoena come out of his mouth. He supports a subpoena for the drone strike members if the administration won't hand them over. Secondly, Press Durbin to ask pointed questions in the hearing to get at some of the issues that the administration has buried. How many civilians have been killed? Scale. We met when I was in Pakistan, this delegation, we met with the U.S. ambassador in Pakistan, acting U.S. ambassador uh, Richard Hoagland. And he said, you know, I checked the number on the way over. It's classified. The U.S. government has an official count of the number of civilians it thinks it has killed in Pakistan with drone strikes. And that number is classified. Why? Why is that number classified? Is that a military secret? Why aren't we allowed to know, we American citizens, taxpayers and voters, why aren't we allowed to know how many civilians the government thinks it's killed. Is it true the CIA has classified every military-aged male killed by a drone strike as a militant? True or false? Is it true that the CIA has conducted so-called secondary strikes in Pakistan where they hit a target and then they wait for other people to come, including civilian rescuers. And then they hit the same target again, killing the other people. This has been reported in press accounts. The United Nations Special Rapporteur for Extrajudicial Executions was asked about this, and he said, the United States is doing this, that's a war crime. And the reason that this is, a key reason this is important, in addition to the fact that it's obviously egregious, 
is that you know, there's this debate about whether the, what the U.S. is doing in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia. Is this a war? The official U.S. government position is 2001, Congress authorized military force after the September 11th attacks. There's no geography in that authorization. It doesn't say anything about Afghanistan. It says that the president is authorized to attack the people responsible. He deemed responsible for the September 11th attacks and whoever harbored them. And the Bush and Obama administration interpreted this to me. Al-Qaeda, anybody called Al-Qaeda, anybody with a associated force. Okay. So this debate, you know, international law people, people in the world, don't accept this idea of a war without borders. But even if it were the case that it's a legal war, even if the war is legal, you can't do anything you want, even in a legal war. You can't wantonly kill civilians, even in a legal war. And secondary strikes are a war crime, even in the context of a legal war. That's why this is devastating if the uh, government can be forced to answer the question of whether it's conducted secondary strikes. Finally, what percentage of the people killed by drone strikes have been high-level targets, senior terrorist leaders. The record of independent reporting suggests that number is 2%. While the percentage of people killed who were children has been 6%. And the percentage of people killed who have been civilians has been 20%. If those numbers are anything like correct, it's pretty hard to square that with the story that the program is targeted, narrowly targeted on high-level terrorist targets. It's pretty hard to square that with the story that civilian casualties have been extremely rare. So if we can force a meaningful public debate on these questions. This policy is politically vulnerable. This policy, you know, that sunlight is the best disinfectant. This policy cannot. This policy cannot withstand public scrutiny on these questions. This is how we can change this policy, or it's a key way we can change this policy by focusing on these questions. And Dick Durbin is key. Dick Durbin is key. And therefore, all of us in this room have a lever that people in other parts of the United States don't have. Because Dick Durbin isn't their senator. He's our senator. And you in particular in Carbondale, you know, if Dick Durbin's office starts to get phone calls and emails and contact from people in Carbondale saying, we want you to press and pressure on these questions, it's going to change the dynamics in that office. So this is my appeal to you. Please do something in the next week, especially before Tuesday, to contact that office and press them on these questions because it could have a decisive impact on future efforts to reform this policy. Thank you very much. So, uh, shall I play the role of moderator? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. was in Germany in 1942, and they had a motto, we will not be silent, speaking out against civilians being killed by, by the military, especially the Jews. Um, so I would suggest that people might start wearing a white rose to similarly stand up against the military killing civilians. Um, 
And also, I would like to mention that we had this, several groups like this meeting, and we had people from all over the United States meeting like three times a year to discuss the things about corruption and government and atrocities and like the World Trade Towers coming down at the speed of gravity, which could only have been done by controlled demolition. And we had thousands of people meeting, and gradually they got disrupted. And there'd be less and less people. It got down to just a couple hundred people meeting each time. The meetings were disrupted by people. People were passing out marijuana and stuff and saying people were crazy and promoting disruption among the people. And well, we appreciate what you share with us. Thank you very much. Yes, Brother. Yes, uh, my son serves in the U.S. Army and he served in Afghanistan. And he participated in missions where uh, uh, they went in in helicopters and either captured or killed militants. And so uh, I honestly welcome the uh, drone program initially because of the low cost in American lives that it uh, has. Uh, it seems to have uh, taken on a more indiscriminate face at this time. So that's where my concern comes. Um, uh, so, you know, I think there's some value in the drone itself as a, as a weapon, as a tool, because of my concern about American life. Uh, that, and if you want to speak to that, another uh, would be, uh, I don't understand how there would be any tactical value in a double tap. I don't see why we would do, uh, that would be, even be done. Is there, is there a reason for Doing that? Yeah, let me take the second question for you. Why would they do a double tap? I think the mentality is the mentality of the CIA is that in an insurgent controlled area, every man with a gun is a combatant enemy of the United States. And particularly if they're in proximity to a target, so that the attitude is that if there's a strike and then men come, those men are militants. So we got to kill more militants, so yay we win. That's, I'm sorry to say, that's the mentality. It's, it's a body count uh, mentality. Um, and, you know, I, I was in this debate with a general in Duke, and I, somebody asked the same question, and I gave the same answer, that, you know, this is how they see it. What were they, what were those people doing there if they're innocent? And this general said, yeah, what were they doing there if they were innocent? So, I mean, that kind of validates that I have correctly, uh, you know, my sense of what the mentality is that produced that, at least is validated by that general, he agrees. Um, uh, as to your question of, you know, is there an argument that the, the drone program is a lesser evil compared to, uh, you know, occupying Afghanistan, occupying Iraq? I think the main thing is, you know, I try and avoid that. Personally, I try and avoid that existential question of, you know, are you for the drone program as an abstraction? Notice I never said anything about that. And I was trying to avoid saying anything about that. Because I think it's the wrong question. Focus and attention on the wrong area. After all, remember, we're in a context where a lot of people have a fantasy view of what the drone program is. So I think the danger is that you get sidetracked in a debate about an abstraction without focusing on attention on what the reality is. Right? Like, the abstraction isn't actually on the menu in the restaurant. What's on the menu in the restaurant is the reality. And I think it's important to challenge supporters of the program who want to defend the abstraction. Particularly what they want to defend is, the, the debate they want to draw you into is um, targeting high-level terrorists with drone strikes. This happened in every debate I'm in, just another one. They always say, like, you know, don't you want to kill these high-level Al-Qaeda people that are threatening the United States? So, I think the challenge of them is, you know, should the United States 
have a secret war where we're not allowed to know what the government is doing. Um, and if, when we force the reality out into the open, where we have a public debate over the policy that's based on the actual reality, then if the American people want that policy, so be it. I don't think they will. But the first step is we have to force the reality into the open. And then let's discuss whether we want the reality rather than the abstraction. so-called legal memos as a strategy, because a legal memo is basically just an opinion on a law. It is not a law, and we know that it's against international law to go into other people's countries and murder them. No matter what the president says, they might be bad guys, as, as he likes to say. So number one, it doesn't matter what the legal memo says, that is not a law. And we have laws against assassination. We have international law to protect sovereign countries from being invaded by other countries that come in and kill their people. So I think that's a distraction. We know what the Obama is doing is illegal, right off. We don't need their memo. John, you did a memo saying torture was legal. Most people here would reject that. Why would you accept that if Obama has lawyers that says assassinating people is legal, then it's legal? It's not. That's a, that's a Distraction And number two, the role of Congress is not to oversee the uh, executive branch murdering people. The role of Congress is to declare a war. They, Congress declares war, not the president. And it is up to Congress to either declare war or not. The executive branch is supposed to faithfully execute the laws, not execute people. Execute the laws. And what Obama is doing on Murder Tuesdays is picking out who he's going to execute, Congress shouldn't oversee that. Congress shouldn't question that. That's illegal. That's unconstitutional. The whole thing should be stopped, whether it's moral or whether it's better to kill civilians and soldiers, you know, which is, of course, also against military law, is irrelevant. This whole thing's illegal, and it must be stopped, in my opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, can I address that? Yeah, sure. So, I think that for me, the key question is, how do we get from where we are to somewhere else? There are very few Americans that would sign up to what you just laid out. And there are maybe not even five members, certainly less than five, maybe zero members of Congress that would sign up to what you just laid out. So, I, I don't dispute the passion of your views, um, but I think for engaging in the U.S. political process as it exists today, it's not a helpful starting point. And my concern is, I mean, you know, let a hundred flowers bloom. You can get, you know, if you can get rally a bunch of people around that to do something great. Um, but my concern is that I think the attitude that uh, you have to say all drone strikes are illegal, you have to say all drone strikes are murder, and you're not allowed to do anything else, isn't going to help us engage a bigger group of people in this issue and make movement in the political system of the United States as it exists today. And that's my principal concern, is engaging more people and trying to get some movement, because that's what's going to save lives. Yes, sir. Uh, I just have a question. Um, this, the CIA is certainly involved with drones, but aren't they also part of the military activities? And isn't 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 it likely that those two sets of policies are quite different? Yeah. So the CIA is conducting drone strikes. The military is conducting drone strikes. The big part of the story is the CIA. The overwhelming majority of drone strikes since 2004 have been in Pakistan and have been conducted by the CIA. So that's where the focus of criticism has been because that's where most of the drone strikes are conducted by the CIA in 
Pakistan. It's hard to say precisely how different the policy is because it's so hard to get information. But there is a significant body of opinion that if the government were forced to move drone strike from the CIA to the military, it would be easier to get more information. It would be easier to force compliance with international law. Because whatever you may say about the US military, CIA is much worse as far as the CIA doesn't even accept the principle that it has to comply with international law. The CIA does not even accept the principle that it has to comply with international law. So how can you hold the CIA accountable to compliance with international law when you like you bring international law to them and they laugh in your face and say, well, you know, that, that doesn't apply to us. Um, so that's why some Groups like Human Rights Watch for a couple years have been calling for all CIA drone strikes to be um, transferred. All drone strikes should happen in the military. And there's other reasons for that. And in fact, the administration has rhetorically um, put forward the idea that they want to move drone strikes from the CIA to the military. But unfortunately, this A, nothing's happened at all. B, even if something did happen, the New York Times has reported that it wouldn't apply to CIA drone strikes in Pakistan. Like they they carve out this exception of the CIA drone strikes in Pakistan, which is most of the drone strikes and most of the CIA drone strikes. So that's meaningless. Then there's a third concern, which is that um, military special forces is also not really transparent to the public, the media, and Congress. And in some ways, the reporting requirements the Congress are even lower. So that would have to be fixed if moving the, the drone strikes to the military uh, were to be a meaningful positive reform. But beyond all that, I mean, I think the, the, the most important thing is, like, is that you know, we're in a very beginning stage. I think the track record indicates that one should not have any faith, uh, any trust, and any reform whose implementation you can't see, given that all of the actors in Washington have a terrible track record of doing oversight over this policy. Um, I think in the first reform that we need is to force the administration to disclose these memos because the memos specify what the policy is by saying, what the, the legal interpretation is, that tells you who they think they can target. So that tells you who they're targeting. That's a key piece of information that they refuse to disclose. That's a key piece of information you would need to do oversight of the policy. If we can't get Congress to force the uh, disgorgement of these documents, then you know I think other, uh, other reforms are very tight. Well, we're just going to take one more question now, but I'm sure you'll, we have refreshments for everyone uh, for some time to continue talking outside. I'm going to go ahead and take this gentleman's question back here. My name is Sami, I'm a U.S. citizen of Pakistan origin, so I can give you a perspective on that. Okay, that, uh, as you said, India and also in that 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 area has been cordoned off. I would like to know who has cordoned it off. Is, is it the Pakistani military or it is the U.S. military over there? Number one. Number two is those people in the tribal areas of Waziristan, which is part of Pakistan. It is naturally actually uh, divided up by the British in 1947. Then when they partitioned the subcontinent India into Pakistan and Afghanistan. Actually, it's, it's not a natural line. Half of the people who live in Afghanistan have relatives in Pakistan, so they travel very frequently across the border. And they are very fiercely independent people, and their jewel is a gun. Everybody who is of age carry a gun. I'm not talking about a pistol or a revolver. They carry a gun, okay? And if they are killing people, anybody who, who has a gun, they have to kill a lot of people, okay? 
and uh, I think the, there is also a collaborator in this whole thing, which is Pakistani government. They are collaborating with U.S. in uh, and not saying anything. Pakistan is a nuclear country, and they are fully capable of shooting down or capturing these drones. But they are they are they have chosen not to do so because being an ally. So those are the things that we should know. And I think we should also apply pressure on Pakistani government to open those areas for uh, journalists to go in there and see what they cannot see, what people don't know. Or in, in Pakistani news media, all they say is there was another drone strike and so many terrorists were killed. And that's it. Okay. So let me, uh, <clears throat> my offer is coming up. So uh, let, let me address the things you said. So first of all, who has cordoned off the tribal areas? Uh, it is the Pakistani government that has cordoned off tribal areas. Foreigners are not allowed to go without special permission. Right, that's right. Um, some very few journalists have managed to uh, sneak in. But it's, been, it's a huge problem with getting information about what's going on. Because for the most part, when you get, you know, like, if you see there's a drone strike, and it's reported in the press, and we'll say, you know, five suspected militants were killed. Well, suspected by whom? You know, who says five suspected militants were killed? Well, usually that was some Pakistani government official who told the reporter. There were no reporters on the ground saying, you know, we were there and we saw what happened. So it's been a huge problem. It's one of the reasons that reports like this living under drones report is so important because they were they were able to go not they didn't go to Waziristan, but they went near Waziristan. People from Waziristan met them and they and they talked with those people. So that's a hugely important um, issue. You know, should there be pressure on the government of Pakistan? Absolutely. I'm an American citizen, <laughs> so I'm living in the United States. I focus on, you know, what I want Americans to do. If I were Pakistani, I would be giving a very different talk. Um, and there are groups in, in Pakistan that are pushing very hard on the uh, Pakistani government on this issue and do see the Pakistani government as totally colluding in this policy. And there's significant evidence that they are, which is one of the reasons that I don't focus on the issue of sovereignty, because that's murky. The question of the degree of Pakistani government uh, complicity and, and cooperation in the policy is murky. But as I said earlier, that's one issue. The, the, uh, whether the Pakistani government is given permission, that's one issue. But some things are illegal no matter what. Even if the Pakistani government gives permission, secondary strikes are a war crime. So that's why it's so important, I think, to focus on things that you know, are scandalous no matter what the Pakistani uh, government has said. I think we're going to close it down right there. Um, but also hope the conversation continues after the, this formal part. And, uh, you all will feel free to ask questions.